Alright, today is Tuesday, March 7th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Now uh, folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And uh, what happened today? I was asleep all day, missed the market. What happened? Oh yeah, Papa Jerome was speaking and uh, he did crash the market as he intended, of course. And what's really baffling to me is how surprised the market is. Did the market really think that Jerome Powell will come out today and say, yeah, folks, inflation is over. We're done with the job. Uh, no more rate hikes. Matter of fact, we're going to start cutting rates. Let's party, baby. Did the market really think that, that would be the outcome? Or maybe the market is just stupid and led by monkeys and robots with no intelligence involved at all. Just put your blindfolds on and buy, 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 buy. It's a generational buying opportunity, bruh. Okay, but here's what happened today. Breaking, Jerome Powell said the Federal Reserve could speed up rate increases and will likely lift rates more than previously expected to fight inflation in the strong economy. What's strong? What the heck? What is, what's wrong with these people? But anyways, what happened to uh, disinflation process, Mr. Pound? What happened to uh, disinflation 15 times in the last FOMC? Now all of a sudden you want to do more rate hikes? I thought we got disinflation. I thought we're done with the job. 25 basis points. There may be another one. Then we pause and boom, it's over. This is why you cannot trust this guy at all. He has no clue how to do the job at all. And unfortunately, the monkeys and the robots, they've been following this guy. When he said disinflation 15 15 times when he said, yeah, maybe we're going to have a soft landing. But we told you in this channel, folks, the Fed, Jerome Powell, all of these fools, they're not in charge. Who's in charge? The answer is inflation. The Fed will continue to follow whatever inflation feeds them. The Fed continues to be behind the curve. The Fed continues to be in the passenger seat while inflation is driving us. And by the way, it is driving us off the Grand Canyon. And it seems that the Fed says uh, we're going to be nimble. We're going to be data dependent, meaning uh, we're just going to dance on uh, what whatever tune inflation wants to play. We're never going to be proactive. We're just going to be reactive to whatever uh, inflation wants. Or we're going to cross our fingers and hope that inflation uh, will get bored and just uh, leave the economy at some point. The food is terrible over here. And of course, the result is every time the Fed falls behind the curve, they have to play catch up. They have to come out even more aggressive and damage the economy even more. But if they did the job when they were supposed to, by now we could have turned back the inflation page. We'd be done with it. It's over. Minimal damage to the economy and stun. But because we have these incompetent fools leading the Fed, this is what we continue to get. This keeps happening over and over and over and over again. We get one reading of inflation maybe cooling off month over month. And by the way, most of these readings are cooked to begin with. The government cooks give us the illusion that inflation is cooling down. And then they revise all of these numbers higher again. This is exactly what happened in December's reading, November's reading. Of course, Jerome Powell took these readings and said, uh, yeah, maybe inflation is cooling down because it's going down month over month. Maybe we're getting close uh, with uh, getting the job done here. And immediately the market looks at this and says, oh, OK, I guess the Fed is going to pump the market higher again. We have to stampede like a bunch of morons and create these dumb ratties. And then, of course, they come out and say, whoops, the data actually shows that inflation never went down. It's actually moving higher again. And then the Fed has to do a cleanup job and come out more aggressive. This happened last summer. It's happening again. And when are we going to learn, folks? The result of all of that is now we have perhaps the worst yield curve inversion we have seen in four decades. Now, in English, what does that mean? It means that the recession is one million million percent in the bag and this upcoming recession will be bigger than them all what about the jobs market maverick the jobs market is still good jobs are plentiful as uh, jamie diamond might say yeah jobs are plentiful right now but here's what's gonna happen you want to hear it how about unemployment rate rising above 10 percent i know i know it sounds crazy right now but you know what else sounded crazy last year how about the fed raising rates to above five percent when i said that last year folks said oh maverick you're conspiracy theorist, you're an alarmist, you're, 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 you're a perma bear, you're, you're spreading the FUD. And now everybody's just uh, assuming that, hey, we're going to go to 5%. It's happening. It's not a conspiracy theory anymore. And you know what? Let's talk about it. And here it is in Focus Tonight.
the ugly truth we will never be able to solve the inflation problem right now at this stage without inducing mass layoffs in the economy without jacking the unemployment rate significantly higher today it appears that the fed chairman jerome powell finally is succumbing to reality unlike the last fomc he's no longer selling us the soft landing fantasy anymore if anything he's pretty much saying yeah we're gonna see a lot of pain all of a sudden jackson hall powell is back and how can he not? Just look at the macro data we've been getting so far. In the morning, we got the Mannheim Used Cars Price Index, which uh, measures the prices of used cars, just in case you didn't know. And guess what happened? We got a massive rebound in the month of February, big time. Prices went higher by 4.3% month over month. And this happens to be the highest increase since 2009. Prices across the board went higher. Pickups, SUV, minivans, sedans, buggies, everything. Everything went higher. But I know the CPLI, of course, would come out next week and say that used cars prices actually went down month over month. Okay, so now Pal comes out and says, we are very far from price stability band-aid. Um, I thought last time around you said that we are at the restrictive rate. What happened to that, Mr. Pound? Well, maybe, maybe you're just speaking out of your ass with no knowledge, with no comprehension at all to the problem that you're supposed to solve the problem that you caused to begin with with your arrogance ignorance and lack of competence when you ushered the tsunami of liquidity trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to do what to save the economy of course not you did it because you wanted to prop up stocks and real estate values the moment we got the great panic back in 2020 the banksters the wall streeters they picked up the phone they called the fed you gotta do something right now we're losing money damn it and the Fed did uh, rescue the stock market, not the economy, and produced an insane asset bubble mania. And even when it became really clear that inflation is here and it is becoming really intense and it's not due to supply issues, the chairman of the Fed kept denying the facts. He kept saying that inflation is transitory, transitory, transitory. We're not thinking about thinking about thinking about tapering or raising rates to tame this inflation problem. Because after everybody rolls their sleeves and they get the shot, we can reopen the economy and the supply chain will be back and boom problem solved when we knew and this was settled back in the 70s melton friedman inflation has always always been a monetary phenomenon you print more money trillions and trillions of dollars you overstimulate the economy you're gonna get inflation it's not about a supply problem but of course leave it to the genius jerome pal and the geniuses in dc of course to continue to think that this is a supply problem and now we have to trust the arsonist jerome pal to put down the fire of inflation well anyways we're here now there was no point of crying on the past. So what do we have to do now to tackle inflation down? The answer is raise rates above the inflation rate ASAP and guide inflation down while the economy has some cushion to absorb the shock. Because later on down the road, this cushion will disappear. The economy will be a lot weaker. And higher rates then will be more damaging to the economy than now. With that background, with that understanding out of the way, perhaps the most interesting encounter in today's testimony was between uh, Senator uh, from Masshole, Elizabeth Warren, and Chairman Powell. Let's go to D.C., pay a visit, and watch the clown show. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the Fed has raised interest rates eight times over the last year in what has been the most extreme rate height cycle in 40 years. The Fed's goal is to slow inflation, and your tool, raising interest rates, is designed to slow the economy and throw people out of work. So far, you haven't tipped the economy into recession, but you haven't brought inflation entirely under control either. And maybe the reason for that is that other things are also keeping prices high, things you can't fix with high interest rates, things like price gouging and supply chain kinks and a war in Ukraine. So here we go with the delusion. Oh, it's uh, price gouging. It's supply issues. It's Putin. We know that inflation has been rising before Putin. We know, and I showed you the data yesterday, that there is no supply chain problem anymore. It's over. It's done. Yet inflation continues to stick because inflation has always been a monetary phenomenon. When it comes to price gouging, yes, this is happening. But price gouging is a symptom, not a cause for inflation. But of course, the senator is, uh, well, God bless her. Let's just say that. Continuing. But you are determined to continue to raise interest rates, so I want to take a look at where you're headed. In December, the Fed released its projections on the state of the economy under your monetary policy plan. According to the Fed's own report, 
If you continue raising interest rates as you plan, unemployment will be 4.6% by the end of the year, more than a full point higher than it is today. Chair Powell, if you hit your projections, do you know how many people who are currently working, going about their lives, will lose their jobs? Um, how about you just tell me the f***ing answer so we can stop playing games? I don't, uh, I don't have that number in front of me. I will say it's, it's not, it's it's not just an intended a consequence. It's well, not but it is, and it's in your report, and that would be about 2 million people who would lose their jobs. People who are working right now, making their mortgages. So, Chair Powell, if you could speak directly to the 2 million hardworking people who have decent jobs today, who you're planning to get fired over the next year, what would you say to them? How would you explain your view that they need to lose their jobs? I would explain to people more broadly that, that inflation is extremely high and it's hurting the working people of this country badly, all of them, not just 2 million of them, but all of them are suffering under high inflation and we are taking the, the only measures we have to bring inflation down. And putting 2 million people out of work is just part of the cost and they just have to bear it? Will, they, will, will working people be better off if, if we just walk away from our jobs and, and inflation remains 5-6%? Well, let, let me ask you about what happens if you do this. Since the end of World War II, there have been 12 times in which the unemployment rate has increased by one percentage point within one year, exactly what you're aiming to do right now. How many of those times did the U.S. economy avoid falling into a recession? You know, it's it's not as black and white as it, it very, Just very Just looking at the numbers, it actually yeah, no, is no. pretty black Alan and Blinder's white. written a book on this. And, there have and, been 12 times that yeah. we've seen a one-point increase in the, in the unemployment rate in a year. That's exactly what your Fed report has put out as the projection and the plan based on how you're going to keep raising these interest rates. How many times did the economy fail to fall into a recession after doing that out of 12 times? I think the number is zero. I think the number is zero. Um, duh. The natural evolution of the cycle of inflation is inflation becomes stagflation, then becomes a recession. Fed or no Fed. That is the natural evolution of the inflation cycle. And I thought uh, Senator Warren was an economics professor or something. Anyways. That's exactly right. So then the question becomes, we've got 2 million people out of work. Can you stop it? at 2 million people. Um, history suggests that the Fed has a terrible track record of containing modest increases in the unemployment rate. Once the economy starts shedding jobs, it's kind of like a runaway train. It is really hard to stop. In fact, in 11 out of the 12 times that the unemployment rate increased by a full percentage point within one year, unemployment went on to rise another full percentage point on top of that. If that's what happens this time, we'd be looking at at least three and a half million people who would lose their jobs. So, Chair Powell, if you reach your goal and two million people get laid off by the end of this year, and then, just like in 11 out of 12 times that unemployment has risen by a point in a single year, it keeps on rising, and then we've got two and a half million people out of work. We've got three million people who get laid off. We've got three and a half million people who get laid off. What's your plan? Uh, my plan is, uh, isn't that what uh, Twitch and OnlyFans were made for? Well, right now the unemployment rate is 3.4%, which is the lowest in 54 years. And we actually don't think that we need to see a sharp or enormous increase in unemployment to get inflation under control. I, I'm looking at your projections. Do you call two mi laying off two million people this year not a sharp increase in I unemployment? I would say four and a half percent. Explain that to the two million families who are going to be out of work. We're not again. We're not targeting any of that. We're, but I would say even four and a half percent unemployment is is well better than than most of the time for the last you know, 75 years. In other words, you don't have a plan to stop a runaway train if it occurs. You know, Chair Powell, you are gambling with people's lives, and there's a pile of data showing that price gouging and supply chain kinks and the war in Ukraine are driving up prices. You cling to the idea that there's only one solution, 
lay off millions of workers. We need a Fed that will fight for families. And if you're not going to lead that charge, we need someone at the Fed who will. Yeah, we need a Fed chairman who can fight for Wall Street, who can keep rates low so we can pump the stock market higher. And who cares about the middle class and the poor and inflation? That's just because of uh, Putin, uh, supply chain, price gouging, something. But she's right that Jerome Powell is gambling with the American people's life. Actually, he already gambled with our lives when he decided to usher the tsunami of liquidity. Of course, back then, both Republicans, Democrats, including Warren, had no problem with that at all because it was pretty much uh, bribing their constituents, number one, number two, pumping the stock market higher. And they all thought there are no consequences consequences for that. Well, we do have consequences for that. We're paying for that now. They already gambled with our lives, Senator, and you signed for it. Remember that? And by the way, when you say that, oh, uh, getting rid of two million jobs right now, how could you do that? Well, how could you leave inflation this high? Yes, we're stuck between two shitty choices. Either we get rid of two million jobs and reduce inflation for everybody else, or let inflation be to save those two million jobs. And then inflation becomes hyperinflation, stagflation, and guess what? Instead of losing 2 million jobs, we're going to lose 20 million jobs because that will become a depression. If you let inflation go, it will become systemic and companies will have to resort to laying off employees anyways. But of course, the good senator has no understanding of that at all. Look, I, I didn't make the rules. I know this is the Hunger Games slash the jungle economy, capitalism, gangsterism, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter to me, but it is a criminal economic system. But again, I didn't make the rules. We got to play with the rules that we have. And the rules we have right now say, number one, either you let inflation go and wreck the economy for decades to come. Look at what happened to Japan. Or you solve inflation, but there is a sacrifice. And unfortunately, the sacrifice is not going to come from the Wall Streeters, the oligarchs. They already cashed out. They sold their stocks and real estate assets back in 21 at the top of the market. They're not going to suffer. They're rubbing their hands. They can't wait for the crash. So they can scoop all of these assets once again at a cheaper price and centralize their power over the economy even more. And who pays the price? The answer is regular folks. Regular folks going to lose their jobs to solve this inflation problem. It is a horrific choice, but it is a lot better than letting inflation go. Look at what's happening right now, Senator. Many Americans have exhausted their savings as credit card debt hits record high. Americans are exhausting their savings right now to cope with inflation. And now that they have no savings left at all, they have to resort to swiping those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down. And the result of this swiping up and down, up and down is $1 trillion. No, this is not the national debt. This is the credit card debt that Americans have right now. You're happy with this, Senator? But I know I, it's Putin's fault. He's the one who forced me to swipe those credit cards up and down. Millennium and now adding $3.8 trillion worth of debt in the last quarter alone. You don't see a problem here, Senator? The American dream is dead. Home affordability is now the worst that it has been all the way back to 1986. We have an entire generation, millennials, Gen Zers. They can't afford to own homes anymore in this economy. Is this what you want to keep, Senator? Rents are now eating away 30% of the monthly disposable income for households in the United States. The highest ratio ever. You happy with this, Senator Warren? When you talk about, oh, the economy that we have right now, people have jobs. Yeah, they have jobs, but it's called corporate slavery. They got jobs. Some actually have multiple jobs to cope with inflation. But even with that, they're losing to the inflation rate because whatever wage growth they're having right now, that is lagging the rate of inflation and the prices around them. We have at least 3 to 2% gap between the CPI and wage inflation. Workers are losing. Net, net, they're losing money. This is the economy. When a keep, Senator. And by the way, we talked about this in this channel a long time ago. I said, prepare for the tsunami of layoffs. And people called me an alarmist, a perma bear, yada, yada, yada. But I warned you back then that this uh, layoffs phenomenon will become contagious. And the reason is when companies' margins are squeezed because the revenues are not growing as fast as their expenses, they have to reduce the growth rate in their expenses. The easiest way to do that is laying off some of your employees. And once companies do that, an Investors in the stock market react positively to these layoff announcements. Look no further than Meta, for example, as a company. Since announcing mass layoffs, the stock rocketed higher. Once other companies see that, they will say, okay, I guess uh, we're going to have to announce mass layoffs too to please our investors and uh, 
pump our stocks higher so we can dump and cash out. And now the stock market is looking for more layoffs. Feed me more and more and more layoffs. Every time a company announces layoffs, the stock shoots up higher. So Fed or no Fed, companies will get rid of employees anyways. And let's be honest here. I also said before that to solve this inflation problem, Jerome Powell will become Nero. And Nero is going to burn everything down. He has to burn the economy down. This inflation, as sticky as it is, as powerful as it is, it is going to require a disaster in the economy to rid it of inflation. And the truth is, and we've been saying this all along, the Fed has to raise rates above the inflation rate. It is just a matter of when. When are they going to realize they have to do that? If they do it the sooner, the better. Because had they done it last year, the economy had plenty of cushion to absorb the shock. Not anymore right now. The Fed, slowly but surely, is getting to that conclusion that they have to raise rates above the inflation rate. The problem is, by the time they do that, the economy will be already damaged and raising rates at that time will be a double whammy that will amplify the pain in the economy. But again, we're heading that way. And how high will the unemployment rate go when this is all said and done? I want you to hear an encounter, perhaps the most intelligent encounter that we got today. And it comes from Louisiana Senator Kennedy. Now, hearing the way he speaks, you'd think that he is the biggest dimwit in the Senate, but turns out today Senator Kennedy contributed the most intelligent encounter with Jerome Powell. He walked him into a trap slowly, step by step, little by little. He wanted him to admit something here. And of course, Jerome was weaseling his way out of it, but Kennedy got him. And Jerome fell into the trap and admitted something that he didn't want to admit. But it is the truth. It is the ugly truth. I'm going to play the whole thing for you and pay attention to how he got him. Take a look. When Congress spends money, it stimulates the economy, does it not? Well, it, it would depend on whether that's funded by tax increases or not. But, so if there's a spending that's, that's not accompanied by taxes would have a net at the margin stimulative effect. Well, and when Congress borrows money to spend even more, that stimulates the economy even more, does it not? At the margin, yeah. Okay. If Congress reduced the rate of growth in its spending and reduced the rate of growth in its debt accumulation, it, it would make your job easier in reducing inflation, would it not? It, I don't think fiscal policy right now is a big factor driving inflation at this moment, uh, but it's absolutely essential that we do uh, slow the pace of growth, particularly for the areas of the budget. All right, let's try growing. to unpack this then. <clears throat> I'm not trying to trick you. You're raising interest rates. You're raising interest rates to slow the economy, are you not? Yes, to cool the economy off. Um, and one of the ways you measure your success, other than fluctuation in gross domestic product is the unemployment rate. Is it not? Yes, one of the measures. Okay. So in effect, this, I'm not being critical. When you're slowing the economy, you're trying to put people out of work. That's your job, is it not? Not really. We're trying to, we're trying to restore price stability. No, um, you're, trying to, you're trying to raise, not, not the, wages. Un, you're trying to raise the unemployment rate. There are and, a lot, and so there that are a lot me, of... That me, I know you don't like the phrase, so let me strike it. You're trying to raise the unemployment rate, are you not? No, we're not trying to raise it. We're trying to realign supply and demand, which could happen through a bunch of channels, like, for example, uh, you know, just job openings. All job right, let, openings me, let could... me put it another way, okay? The economists did a, did a wonderful study. They looked at, at, at 10 disinflationary periods in America going all the way back to the 1950s. Disinflation is what you're trying to do. It's a slowing in the rate of inflation. Am I right? Yes. In other words, prices don't go down. They just don't go up as fast. Deflation is when prices actually go down. You're trying to achieve disinflation, are you not? Yes, we are. Okay. Based on history, in the 10 times that we got inflation down, disinflation since the 1950s, in order to reduce inflation by 2%, unemployment had to go up 3.6%. Now, that's history, is it not? 
I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yes, the standard has been that there have been recessions and downturns when okay. the Fed has tried to reduce inflation. Now, right now, the, the current inflation rate is 6.4%, and the current unemployment rate is 3.4%. Now, if history is right, I'm not asking you to, 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 again, blame anybody, but if history is right, unless you get some help in order to get inflation down from 6.4%, to let's say 4.4 percent, and the unemployment rate is going to have to rise to 7 percent based on history. That's what the record would say. Okay, and to get inflation down to 2.2 percent, based on history, an immutable fact, unemployment would have to go to 10.6 percent. Would it not? No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. That's uh, what the record. Show, that's what the history shows. Yeah. I, I don't think that kind of a number is is at all in play I mean, here. I, I know you're reluctant to admit it, and you don't want to get in the middle of a policy uh, dispute. But I think it's undeniable. It's undeniable that the only way we're going to get this sticky inflation down is to attack it on the monetary side, which you're doing, and on the fiscal side, which means Congress has got to reduce the rate of growth of spending and reduce, reduce the rate of growth of, of debt accumulation. Now, I get that you don't want to get in the middle of that fight. But the more we help on the fiscal side, the fewer people you're going to have to put out of work. Isn't that a fact? Please answer. Good work out there, right? Okay. Sir? It uh, could work out that way. Yes, sir. Thank you. So did you catch that? Kennedy used the facts and the data. And he said if you guys at the Fed want to go down to the 2% target of inflation, historically speaking, using the facts and the data, this will require the unemployment rate to go as high as 10.6%, which will be an epic disaster for the economy. Jerome Powell could not negate that. And the other point that Kennedy makes is, okay, to prevent going this high in the unemployment rate to 10.6, to get inflation down down to 2%, maybe you at the Fed, the monetary policy, you need help from the fiscal policy. You need us at the government here to reduce spending big time. And this will help you out at the Fed to get rid of inflation with minimal damage by maybe the unemployment rate going higher to 5.5%, 6%, but not 10.6%. Now, here's the problem with this assumption. Let's say that the fiscal policy says, okay, no more spending. So all of these infrastructure projects, the handouts that they're giving to the chip industry, for example, to the solar industry, for example, to the EV industry, for example, all of these government handouts are creating jobs. If the government stops spending, those jobs go kaput, gone. So this is not going to help prevent the unemployment rate from going higher in the battle of taking inflation down to 2%. Furthermore, and Senator Kennedy is not going to admit that, but another way the fiscal policy can tighten the belt and reduce borrowing and accumulating of debt is via raising taxes significantly. He's not going to say that that, of course, and I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying this is one of the ways. But the argument of whether that's going to be effective in preventing the unemployment rate from rising higher or not, that's debatable. And I see the impact as being minimal. And the best thing we can do right now to minimize the damage, sure, we need responsible fiscal policy, folks. We can't keep accumulating deficit after deficit after deficit and spend like a drunken sailor and expect everything to be fine. But that's not going to resolve inflation. Inflation is a monetary phenomenon. So the best outcome right now is for the Fed to raise rates aggressively above the rate of the CPI right now. In the March meeting, the Fed has to go by 100 basis points plus. But of course, the Fed is not going to do it because they don't have the guts to do so. God forbid the stock market goes down big. But you know what? The stock market and stock market participants are stupid. They're asking to get slaughtered. They've been fighting the Fed. They've been fighting the reality of inflation. They've been buying every single dip they can find. They've been buying the most overvalued stocks they can find. Can you feel bad for them if they get slaughtered? Of course not. And reality is already sinking in. The reason why we saw a shock in the stock market today, and this is the beginning, by the way, you haven't seen a thing yet, is the fact that the stock market was pricing in interest rate cuts in the beginning of the year year. And even as reality came out with more data pointing out for rebounding inflation, the market dismissed that and said, oh, the Fed is just bluffing. Even if inflation is rebounding, they're not going to be able to do anything at all because raising rates will damage the economy.
economy. The Fed is bluffing. They're going to pivot. So continue to put your blindfolds on and buy, 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 buy. And then little by little, as we got the CPI, the PPI, the PCE inflation rate, all pointing out for higher inflation, the more aggressive Fed, and the bond markets succumbed to reality. So did commodities. So did the dollar. But equities did not because market participants continue to be stubborn. And they say, okay, maybe the Fed will do another 25 or so. And that's it. They're not going to do more than that. But today, they're getting ambushed by reality. The odds for a 50 basis points hike in the next FOMC meeting was standing at about 20% or so before the day began. Right now, the odds for a 50 basis points in the March meeting is over 70%. The market was not prepared for that at all. And now it has to reprice all of that in, which means pulling equities valuations significantly down. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we say all of these stupid Mickey Mouse slash monkey rallies, they're traps to suck the excess liquidity out of the system. They're traps designed to vacuum away the excess money that the donkeys have in the economy. They obviously don't value their money. Had they valued their money, how could they be buying Coinbase and RKK, Carvana, Tesla at this stage when they're still overvalued and rates are going higher? But again, we talked about the jungle economy, the way it's designed, either you let inflation go and everybody gets hurt, or you sacrifice 2 million jobs plus. When it comes to the stock market, it's the jungle too. There is no insurance. There is no protection for being stupid. You hop in. You think that this is a buying opportunity. They let you have your way for a little while. You get excited. This is the bottom. This is the new bull market. Yada, yada, yada. Then they close the clamp on you. Take your money away. And that is the job of bear market rallies. And now that we talked about the stock market a little bit, why don't we segue and cover the stock market information for you. We'll begin with the closing of the indices today. And uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average down by 574.98 points or a decline of 1.72%. The Nasdaq in the red by 145.40 points or a decline of 1 and a quarter percent. The S&P also in the red by 62.05 points or a decline of 1.53%. When we look at the sectors down across the board, shame on all of them, no metals at all, and the laggards led by metals, real estate, and financials. When we look at the advanced to decline ratios, NYSE 20% advancing versus 79% declining. The Nasdaq, 31% advancing versus 67% declining. Now we say all the time when we have such uh, suppressed ratios, at least in the NYSE, we get a bounce at least in the morning in the pre-market session. But the thing is, the ratios in the Nasdaq not suppressed enough, meaning technology and specifically big caps, maybe they have more downside to go. And if they go down, they will drag everything down with them, including the NYSE, the S&P, the IWM, everything will go down following the lead from big caps. And after violating the SPX 4000 threshold, the algos, the quant funds will start selling now. So my expectations are more pain to come. More on that in the heat map analysis and also in the charts analysis. But before we do that, how about we visit commodities? And again, the dollar insane move to the upside today. The dollar gained about one and a quarter percent in a single session. Massive short covering in the dollar and immediately going to see the negative reaction across the commodities cohort. Energy down big. The WTI down down by over 4% in a single session. Brent is down by about 3 and 3 quarters of a percent. Gasoline RBOP down by about 4%. Heating oil futures down by more than 3 and a quarter percent. The exception be it, natural gas up by about 3 and a half percent. Was down big yesterday, number one. Number two, it is already beaten up big time. So it's not going to be as sensitive as crude or metals to the upward move in the dollar. Speaking of metals, down across the board, gold down, silver down, platinum down, copper down, palladium down, everything is down. The big Biggest loser is silver. Silver down by more than four and a half percent today alone. Grains down across the board, with the exception of oats futures, which were up by about four percent for the day. When it comes to meats, muted reactions, the exception being lean hogs futures, which was up by about one and a half percent for the day. Likewise, when it comes to softs, a down day for both cocoa and cotton futures. Lumber was muted. No signal here for lumber one way or the other, but we have an upside day once again for OJ, coffee, and sugar. If the dollar continues to move higher, we're going to see more pain in commodities. And we discussed the outlook for oil in details, by the way, in a previous video. And I told you, I am bullish oil. Unless the Federal Reserve starts taking inflation seriously and they start being aggressive in raising rates and tightening the monetary policy, which will push the dollar significantly higher. If that is the case, oil is not going to be able to escape the Fed's wrath. It is what it is. Do we know now for sure that the Fed will indeed do the job? The answer is not quite, because 50 basis points will be bad for what? 
not bad for equities valuations for now. But will 50 basis points in the next meeting solve the inflation problem? The answer is absolutely not. The Fed remains behind the curve, even with the 50 basis points in the next meeting. On to options, the big casino, what do we see here? The volume all in all is down, but we're seeing more buying of puts versus calls. And coming up in number one, the hottest table by far, is Tesla, the souffle, with around 1 million contracts traded today. Look at this, about 52% of the volume puts, not calls. For weeks and weeks, we've been seeing calls outweighing puts. The retail mom and pops are going bananas, chasing call options for Tesla. Now we're seeing the bears taking charge and saying, okay, enough is enough. You've done your move. Now watch this. More Tesla in the charts analysis, but here it is number two, Apple, with around 880,000 contracts traded today, and about 50.5% of those were puts, so we have puts outweighing calls just by a little bit. The same goes for NVIDIA, number three, with around 750,000 contracts traded today, about 55% of those were puts versus calls. On to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, we begin with the ticker FEZ. This is the European ETF, and so far this year, European markets have been outperforming US ones, and the argument goes that valuations across the Atlantic are a lot better than here. But still, the rally is absolutely ridiculous. It is unexplainable. It doesn't make sense at all. And it will be unwinded. No doubt about it at all. And maybe now that the dollar is moving higher and breaking out finally, we're going to see European equities moving down significantly. And therefore, we have somebody who bought the 39 puts for the expiration date, April 21st, with expectations that the name will move down and lose more than 10% of its value by then. They paid around 32 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around five million dollars this is a big one and this is quite the unusual trade because we don't get these kind of trades often now i am betting against european stocks but i'm choosing the ewg which is uh, the german etf in any case in a day like today when yields are blasting higher the common thinking goes that higher yields are good for banks but actually the opposite is true because when yields go higher it is you can say a double-edged sword if by double-edged sword you mean the blade pointing at you is sharper than the blade you're pointing at somebody else because in this case when rates go higher guess what happens to the mortgage initiation business not so hot so we covered the earnings from u.s bank for example the mortgage unit absolutely abysmal and wells fargo is now getting rid of the mortgage business altogether but when rates go higher and we have a massive yield curve inversion banks have to allocate a lot of their deposits into what into collateral so that freezes their ability to initiate loans and to begin with the demand for loans will go down if we have a recession. So actually, when rates go higher, regional banks are damaged the most. And therefore, we see the KRE, for example, getting absolutely hammered. And here we have a trade against OZK. This is a regional bank out of the south. Somebody bought the 40 puts for the expiration date, May 19th, with expectations that the name will move down and lose more than 5% of its value by then. They paid around one and a half bucks a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around one and a half million dollars. Then what about the trade? for the ticker TSLA Tesla. Maybe somebody's seeing the dip as an opportunity to chase some calls here and bet for higher prices for Tesla. I think they will lose their money. Or it could be somebody who holds the stock right now and they're raising some capital, they're hedging by riding covered calls, which is a smart strategy, by the way. If you hold any of these stocks, you gotta write some covered calls at this point. In any case, we have to look at it from the buyer's perspective. So we have somebody who bought the 210 calls for the expiration date, April 6th, with expectations that the name might move higher and gain more than 12% by the expiration date. They paid around five and a half bucks a piece to enter. This trade all in all spending around five million dollars. Last but not least, if rates are going higher, it's not just the KRE which will get damaged. Energy will also go down if we have more aggression by the Fed. So somebody perhaps hedging here or betting against energy by using the XLE. And they bought the 76 puts for the expiration date, April 21st, with expectations that the name will move down and lose more than 11 and a half of its value by then. They paid around 60 cents a piece to enter. This trade all in all spending around $500,000. On to the heat map, what we see here, a bloodbath across the board. Few exceptions here and there via mechanical reasons, earnings, short covering, etc. But very few examples. Pretty much everything was in the red. It's a bloodbath massacre. We have exceptions in AMD, for example, Costco, some of the airline names such as United, for example, on uh, collision optimism. But all in all, everything is down. 
And if rates go higher, we will see what damage. Financials, Blackstone will go down big. We got bad news for Blackstone, by the way. The headline reads, Blackstone defaults in 531 million euros, Nordic property-backed CMBS. And uh, no wonder why Blackstone is now blocking investors from withdrawing out of its $71 billion read in the month of February. Something big is happening in Blackstone here, folks. Anyhow, if rates go higher, then we have utilities will go down big, rates will go down big, any dividend paying name will go down big. And also, if we have rates moving higher in anticipation of more Fed aggression, the metals and energy will also go down big. With that being said, the fundamentals for energy remain pretty good. The best among all of them. To begin with, energy companies are spending more money than ever on dividends and buybacks, and they're spending less now. Now. They're not investing as much as they used to before. So the margins for energy still holding. Are they going to hold in technology and the cyclical names and financials? I doubt it. But the margins are holding for now in energy. It's going to take a lot of damage for the knees of the energy sector to buckle from a fundamental perspective. But also notice the phenomenon of the yield curve inversion. In today's action, for example, the two-year was significantly higher. The 10, not so much. Now, the home builders, for example, anything related to housing is is more sensitive to the 10 year. Therefore, yes, DR Horton, Lennar, all of these home builders were down, but they were only down slightly. And the reason is the 10 year did not pop higher. It was actually flattish today. And in corporate news, let's talk about Hershey's, a stock that I own in my portfolio. I don't know what happened to Hershey's, but perhaps my explanation is they hired a lot of uh, woke employees, a lot of Gen Zers, perhaps. And among their ideas is uh, plant based Hershey's. And they also got the plant based Reese peanut butter cups. Are you excited because I'm not and then they got uh, they got themselves another problem here they put a trans woman on a candy bar and some consumers are now calling for a boycott here we go again yesterday we talked about governor Kim Jong-un here in California boycotting Walgreens now we have the other side boycotting Hershey's will this be bad for the stock um, I'm actually more concerned about the plant-based Hershey's and since we're talking about companies margins and uh, resorting to laying off employees well guess what's happening in Twitter they got rid of as many employees as they can. But the margins still suck, so they have to resort to uh, selling office plants to the same employees getting fired. Hey, yeah, uh, you might miss the office, so maybe you want to buy a plant just to remember the good old times. No thanks. On to the heat map for the ETFs. What do we see here? Bloodbath across the board. Exception, if you owned any of the inverse indices, you did okay. But uh, besides that, natural gas ETFs were higher today. Off uh, steep losses yesterday, of course. We're talking about UNG. We're talking about BOIL. But besides that, everything is down. The other exception being the XRT retail. And the reason is we have Dick's Sporting Goods reporting earnings. And it was good and the stock was higher significantly. So that pushed the XRT higher. But the other components of the XRT were down big. So keep that in mind. Let's do some charts and then wrap it up. And we begin with SPY. The S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? We talked about the closing below 405. That was negative. And then filling the gap, but not closing above 405. That was yet another sign that the bears are in charge and immediately upon the open today we got a flush down as soon as jerome started speaking and the pain did not stop all the way till the end of the day and the chart lost 400 but the good news is it is keeping for now 398 of support which is a very important number because last time we saw a crossing below 398 immediately we saw massive buying of vix contracts in other words the market is reading this as oh if the spy loses 398 of support then we're probably going to go back to the lows and therefore if we have a closing below 398 then maybe i should buy some spy puts as protection as insurance and this moves the vix higher because the vix tracks put options on the spx and the spy so watch 398 now is there a chance for a rebound let's say by tomorrow for example the answer is possible we'll look at the other side is really oversold can we get a rebound to let's say 400 or 401.20 that is entirely possible but the gravity is now to the downside so long as the dollar and the two-year yield continue to move higher, then we have more expectations of Fed tightening, which means that any rebound in the SPY is to be sold for now. When we look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P, what do we see here? No major support lost, but we have important indicators that that could be the case soon because number one, we have the volume moving higher. Number two, we have the momentum indicators, the RSI back in negative divergence, the MACD indicator accelerating back to the southern 
destination again. We're only waiting for the loss of 3,960 by the end of the week to say, okay, we got a reversal. The Mickey Mouse rebound slash the monkey ratty. Not going to last. And down we go. 3,855. When we look at the SPX, the cash index for the S&P, the most important event from a technical perspective today is the loss of 4,000 as support in the SPX. We saw a little bit of a battle back and forth, back and forth. But then when it became clear that the bears are going to win the battle, we saw an acceleration of selling. This is an hourly chart. Even after the drop that we got today, we don't have oversold conditions on the RSI, which means we could see more downside. And therefore, I say any rebound for now, you got to sell that, you got to short that because we don't have even any oversold conditions on the daily chart for the S&P. We'll look at the Q's, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? It lost 300 support and then it consolidated at around the support of 297.76 over and over and over again. It even attempted to stage a rally, a comeback rally, which failed because the dollar was moving impulsively higher. And it did not take long before the Q's lost 297.76. And now we're in no man's land. We have support at 294.33 and the resistance, of course, 297.76. Can we get a rebound at least in the morning tomorrow? The answer is absolutely yes. Look at the hour side. It is oversold for now. We can get a rebound, but the ultimate destination is further down. We will look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Q's. We got a reversal candle with a confirmation now. We lost support at 12,207. The volume went higher. The RSI is back in negative divergence. It never crossed to positive to begin with, but it is accelerating back down. So is the MACD. All of these indicators are saying, down we go. And this uh, distraction of a pop that we got recently, forget about that. We're going to go down all the way to 11,689. What about the IWM, the Russell 2000, small caps? What do we see here? A flush down all the way to the support of 186.30. Now, the most important support, 188 is gone now, but 186.30 is okay. It held on at least two times before, and the RSI is oversold for now. Can we see a rebound? The answer is absolutely yes. But unless we have a closing above 188 by the end of the day, you got to sell the rip. What happens if 186.30 is lost to support instead? The answer is if we zoom out, we get 183 as the next support. We'll look at the Dixie, an hourly chart. This is what I shared with you in my morning brief on Discord. This is an hourly chart of the dollar. And I said we have two important events here. Number one, we got a sloping descending line of resistance. That's already been broken. So that's bullish sign number one for the dollar. But we still have resistance at around 104.58. The chart is now consolidating in a bull flag pattern. And if we do cross above 104.58, then we're going to see a big move higher for the dollar. And with that comes major declines for the indices. Well, here's what happened. A major pop. And it rallied all the way to my resistance target, which if we use a daily chart instead, we can see the number at 105.63. And this is pretty much exactly where the dollar stopped for now. The hourly chart is really, really over overbought for now. Can we get a pullback in the dollar, at least in the morning, and then we get a rebound in the equities market, and then let's say midday or after the European close, we see the dollar reversing back up after resolving the overbought conditions in the hourly chart, and then we see the indices curling their way back. This is at least my reading for now. The other important thing to watch is, what happens if the dollar does indeed recapture 105.63 as support? What would be the next resistance target? The answer is I got 107 point 20 but most importantly look at the macd indicator we did not even get across producing red impressions in the histogram we got a reacceleration of the bullish momentum producing more green impressions in the histogram and this by the way solidifies the case that the weekly chart is in play when we look at the weekly chart for the dixie look at the macd indicator it is finally crossing and producing positive impressions in the histogram indicating the beginning keyword the beginning of the bullish momentum if that is the case if it closes like this by the end of the week, and we got higher highs to come for the dollar. When we look at gold, what happened today, it did not spend a lot of time above 1842. And now we see the daily chart curling back down. Look at the MACD indicator. It was positive for a little bit, and now it's back down. So again, are we seeing the weekly chart for gold playing out? We'll look at it. Look at this. We have a reversal candle. We have negative divergence on the RSI. We have a negative crossing in the MACD indicator. We're starting to see red impressions in the histogram. If we have a weekly close 
closing that looks exactly like this, then this means we have a negative momentum in gold just beginning. On the other hand, the positive momentum for the dollar is also just beginning. What about UK oil? Brent, what do we see here? It lost 85 for support. Big loss for the bulls today. The good news is the trend line remains intact. And after that, we have 77. But there is no doubt that the picture here worsened for oil bulls. It was looking so far so good, higher we go, back to the hundreds again, but today was a stinker. Because if the Fed is going to be aggressive, we're going to see lower energy prices. That is the entire goal behind Fed tightening, is to push commodities prices down. Now when we look at the daily chart for the yield on the 10 year, what do we see here? No major pop consolidation, some would argue negative. When we look at the MACD indicator in this case, it is not re-accelerating as we've seen with the dollar, for example. It is actually crossing and producing negative impressions in Instagram. It is forming a bear flag pattern. So Maverick, isn't this good for the equities market? Isn't this the reason why the Nasdaq managed to outperform? Perhaps because the robots, a bunch of morons, they look at this and say, okay, the 10 year is not moving down. That means tech is okay, I guess. But it's not okay because the 10 year not moving up, while the two year moving higher is causing the yield curve inversion to deepen. We're now talking about a gap of over 1% between the two and 10. The two is what the Fed follows. In other words, it means higher yields to come. And this is not good for technology. But again, the robots will do what robots do. Now, when we look at the TLT, it is positive for the day. The momentum is accelerating to positive territory, be it in the RSI or the MACD indicator. How is that possible? The answer is the weakness in the 10 year. The longer end of the yield curve is weakening, the shorter end is moving higher. When we have this phenomenon of yield curve inversion getting worse, the TLT tends to outperform. But again, mind you, we covered the weekly chart for the TLT and it doesn't look good. It looks like we have a transitory move higher here in the daily chart. But in the weekly chart, it's going to move down sooner or later. We'll look at the VIX 4 hours chart. What do we see here? Back into the channel again. We have positive momentum both in the RSI and MACD indicators. Pointing out that perhaps we will lose SPY 398. This will allow a lot of buying in the VIX. And we will see the VIX closing the week above 20. This is what I'm seeing for now. We'll look at the weekly chart. Again, a re-acceleration in the positive momentum. The MACD is about to cross to produce green impressions in the histogram. Indicating a major pop coming for the VIX. A pop that we haven't seen since last summer. Keep that in mind. Apple, 30 minutes. What do we see here? Even the big kahuna was weak today. Flushed down all the way to the support of 152.3 or 03, I should say. Consolidation for a little bit, forming a bear flag pattern. And the chart ended up losing the support of 152.03 by the end of the day, indicating that down we go to 150. We're gonna retest 150 sooner or later. If that fails, then down we go all the way back to 145. Now, when we look at the weekly chart that we looked at in last night's video. I said the gap will close. It's a slam dunk trade. Well, there you go. The gap is almost closed. It's going to close precisely if we have a retest at 150. What about Tesla? This is an hourly chart that I uh, shared with you in Discord. I said we have filled the gap and then crap. Number one. Number two, we have a head and shoulder formation. Now, here's the update. We got another tick down by the end of the day. And when we look at it all in all, an hourly chart with my markings back on, the chart did fill the gap. It attempted to wrap all the way to recapture 194.55 as support could not make it reversed down lost the gap support and closed at the lows of the day not a good look here if this continues the ultimate destination is going down to 180 we have some soft support at around 182.6 but if we go down there we might as well go down to 180 bitcoin tulips a daily chart what do we see here it appears that the bear flag consolidation pattern is playing out sooner or later down we go to 20,593.34 and here are some some bonus charts for you. In the morning, I shared this on Discord. We have a daily chart for the SMH, the semiconductor ETF, where it appears to be a bear flag pattern. And I said if the dollar moves higher, down we go. The bear flag is going to play out in the SMH. Here's the update. Not quite playing out, but close enough. If we have another pop in the dollar, the bear flag is going to play out, and the support will be all the way down at 227.35. Another one that I shared with you in the morning today is Meta. An hourly chart, I said, look, we might have a double top coming here. Keep an eye. What do we got today? Almost the double top. Even with the news that Meta is about to initiate more layoffs, we get a gap and crap. 
bad sign that perhaps Meta has now exhausted all of the good news. And from this point on, down we go. The support that I got is 182.86. If that's broken, we go down to closing the gap. And of course, I'm going to give you updates for the other tickers that I covered in the morning, AI and Alibaba. But those charts need to move a little more before we get any significant update. With that, folks, let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the ADP employment report, and this will be critically important because if it comes out soft, we will see the dollar moving down and equities catching a bit. And then it's up to Powell to either accept the ADP if it comes cool to begin with, and maybe soften the rhetoric. Maybe the market is going to like that and initiate a rally for a day or two. But we also got the jolts, job openings and quits. What if that comes out hot? Then we got a problem. What if both the ADP and jolts come out hot? Then immediately you will see the dollar blasting higher. You will see futures down big. You will see PAL coming out in round number two being even more aggressive. And it's going to be a really ugly day. The best hope for the bulls here is at least one of them has to come out cold. Either the ADP or jolts. On top of that, of course, we also have the beige book by the Fed. Oh boy, it's going to be yet another interesting day tomorrow, so buckle up. Why don't you go to bed right now? Because this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And again, you might have noticed that my voice is all over the place, still under the weather, but still getting things done. Anyhow, I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. These fish have manners. In fact, they're coming with me. I'm starting a new company, and the fish will come with me.